I'd like to welcome you all very much, especially of course our speaker for today, uh, Professor Sidney Winter. Let me start by uh, saying a few words about uh, Charles Cooper. This is the Charles Cooper Memorial Lecture. We uh, have had this tradition for uh, a couple of years and unfortunately we have not had a Cooper Memorial Lecture last year. As you know, last year it was a year in which many things were changing within you and you merit and we simply, I must admit, did not uh, get around to organizing the lecture. And I'm very happy that uh, this year we have been able to uh, re-establish that tradition. Uh, certainly we want to continue that over the next couple of years and I'm very happy that indeed we have such a distinguished speaker for, uh, for this lecture. Now Charles Cooper, as you all know, of course, was the uh, person who established the UNU Intech Institute here in Maastricht back in 19. 89, uh, and the UNU Intech Institute, of which he was the first director, then quickly started to cooperate with the Merit Institute, which uh, was directed by Luc Suti. And um, after a long period of cooperation, the two institutes merged into what is now UNU Merit. So in that sense, you could say that both Luc Suter and Charles Cooper were the first director of UNU Merit, and uh, that's of course uh, the reason why uh, we have uh, the, the Charles Cooper Memorial Lecture today. Now, both these people, Luc and Charles, have had their strong intellectual imprint on this institute, and uh, that is the kind of thing that we wish to try to make visible in these uh, in this series of lectures uh, that we have uh, that we have in the in the Charles Cooper Memorial Lecture. Um, Today, this year, we have uh, Professor Sidney Winter, whom most of you, I assume, would know as uh, the, one of the two co-authors of the famous Nelson and Winter book. Um, and that, for many of us here, including myself, of course, is one of the standard works in the field that we're working in. The field of evolutionary economics, the field of innovation economics, uh, whichever perspective you may want to take on this. Now, from my point of view, uh, Sidney Winter in these, this couple, Nelson and Winter, has always been the person who is most deeply into the theory of the firm. And of course that also resonates well with the fact that he is uh, now an emeritus professor of management at the Wharton School uh, in the US. Um, and for me that has been always the bridge between the things that I personally was doing in economics and the, the theory of the firm and the, the management people that I see around myself, the things that they were doing. So for me that has been very well, has been a very uh, relevant source of inspiration and I, uh, and I think we're going to see, uh, judging by the title, we're going to see a little bit of that uh, today. So, um, as an outlook on the lecture, what I would expect is that many of you here would also try to get that inspiration from the lecture that we will have today. We are dealing here with many diverse topics, development, the role of innovation in that, and firms, of course, are very crucial actors in that process. And this uh, idea of evolutionary theory, and especially the role of the firm in evolutionary theory, is something that's very important and very exciting, uh, and therefore I look forward very much to, uh, to this lecture. Sit, you have the floor, please. Thanks very much, Bart. I'm very uh, honored to be here today to give the Cooper Lecture, or at least the three streams of history that converge uh, to make it a particular honor. Uh, first, there is the fact of uh, merit and its history uh, of achievements and the understanding of uh, technological change, economic growth and development. It's been long been one of the global strong points in the effort to understand those subjects. Secondly, uh, uh, there is the legacy of Charles Cooper, whom we honor uh, with this lecture, and um, Cooper provided uh, strong leadership in, uh, in uh, at least three institutions that I know of uh, 
in his involvement in uh, these issues of technology and development, uh, those three that I know of being the OECD, uh, Sussex, and then here. And finally, there is the le uh, legacy of the lecture series itself, uh, which is uh, an impressive thing as I have reviewed it in, in the records on the web. But particularly, there's the fact that uh, my friend and collaborator, Dick Nelson, uh, was the uh, Cooper lecture, uh, lecturer here in uh, 2011. And I hope to exploit that fact uh, today to uh, make use of uh, the complementarity to some extent between uh, Dick's uh, particular uh, interests within the broad field of evolutionary economics uh, and my own interest. And uh, Barth has already uh, stolen the next line. Uh, he has uh, remarked on the fact that in that uh, Nelson and uh, Winter uh, collaboration, uh, I was the uh, R&D and theory of the firm guy, and uh, Dick Nelson was the R&D and technology and economic development guy. And uh, that, that uh, sort of rough division of labor um, uh, between us uh, helped to shape the book and uh, continues to uh, shape our interactions uh, today. Of course, uh, an important remark about, about that complementarity relates to the problem of firms, their opportunities, and how they see them. Uh, if opportunities were, in fact, limited to those uh, contemplated in standard uh, static uh, economic theory, uh, then there would not be uh, much of an issue of uh, bridging uh, to the uh, kinds of concerns that, uh, that Dick represents. Uh, but uh, in fact, as we know, that, that image of what firms uh, have in the way of opportunities is, uh, is enormously uh, deficient in a changing world, in a world in which uh, uh, I have like said in the past, every, every optimization analysis uh, for the firm should carry an asterisk that says at the bottom of the page, unless of course there's a better idea. Right. Because, the, uh, because the optimization that can be done uh, among a given set of alternatives is one thing, but then there is the uh, alternative beyond that of looking for uh, an expansion uh, of the set of possibilities. So because of the, uh, the difficulty, the challenges of thinking usefully about the, the uh, opportunities uh, open to firms, and we see that there is a, a join and a complementarity uh, between the uh, decision problems and, and our approaches to those decision problems in thinking about firm behavior and uh, the realities of technological change and economic uh, growth uh, in the long term. So, I see that I can use the mouse to rearrange here slightly. So, uh, what I'm going to uh, try to do uh, is to follow on this uh, suggestion about the nature of my uh, role in the team and uh, talk a bit about uh, some things that are closer to the business side of the problem of understanding innovation, uh, reflections of the fact that uh, uh, business actors are out to make money and they both adapt to change and also cause it. And I should mention, perhaps, that the uh, journals uh, that I will cite today and the journals uh, which more, more broadly uh, you would find discussion of the issues I talk about today uh, are management journals, uh, particularly uh, the Strategic Management Journal and to uh, uh, some extent and others, including Organization Science. And so uh, these ideas, I don't know whether you can find these ideas at all in a, uh, in a standard economics journal, and um, even in the uh, evolutionary branch of the economics journals, uh, they would be uh, relatively rare. So if you're interested in pursuing any of these questions, uh, keep, that, keep that fact in mind. <laughs> so what I'm going to do then is to uh, explore the meaning of this term change and its relationship uh, to continuity. Uh, as I will suggest in a moment, this is uh, actually a very deep and uh, long-standing uh, uh, philosophical issue, in fact. 
uh, and it has uh, subtleties, and these subtleties have implication, implications for our understanding of innovation and profitability and economic development. And then I will be also introducing you to the ongoing discussion about uh, dynamic capability and uh, confessing uh, to the fact that the uh, situation uh, uh, remains a little murky. Uh, some, some would claim that it's a mess, uh, but I don't think it's uh, 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 an unusual mess. I think it is the typical kind of mess that occurs as we, uh, as we try to uh, move forward. Now here, as I said, there's this uh, philosophical heritage, and in particular, the, these first two quotations uh, offering uh, perspectives on a change. Heraclitus saying you couldn't step into the same river twice, and then uh, Ecclesiastes saying there is no new thing under the sun. And uh, those two expressions of, uh, if not truth, at least reasonable perspective, perspectives uh, on the world it appear to be in stark contradiction. And um, that fact has been exploited by a few people. This particular pairing of these quotations has uh, been used before. In particular, it's been used by my late friend Michael Cohen, it's a very wonderful paper in, in uh, organization science. Uh, and then we have the third one, the, f the familiar plus a change uh, quote, which uh, says uh, to the first two uh, uh, speakers that uh, 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 it, uh, it may look like change, but it really isn't. Uh, and uh, so that is a third uh, alternative. And in that spirit, uh, I'd like to focus with some intensity on this particular quotation. Uh, innovation in semiconductors? I'm not sure there is innovation in semiconductors. They just keep doing the same thing over and over. And this was, statement was made in a meeting I was at, which Dr. Ralph Gummery was a uh, participant. Um, he was at the time the vice president for R&D of IBM, so to some extent in qualified expert observer, I think, on the state of, uh, of the semiconductor industry. Uh, he started his career as a uh, professor of mathematics at Princeton, where he invented, I think, the first or one of the first integer, integer programming algorithms. And uh, after his time at IBM, he was, uh, he was uh, president of the Sloan Foundation for a number of years. So uh, he was indeed a, a very, uh, a very uh, impressive uh, and expert observer on the subject. And I put it to you that it is striking that such an expert observer uh, would say same thing over and over as a characterization of what might be uh, the most central innovative achievement uh, shaping our time. I mean, one could have a debate about uh, picking a single candidate for uh, innovative achievements that shape our time fundamentally. But uh, the progress in semiconductor technology would certainly be a plausible candidate for that because it is that progress uh, that lies behind the progress in the computers and it's the progress in the computers and other uh, devices and exploiting cheap computation that uh, have shaped uh, so much of the way we do things today and, and the differences between the ways we do things uh, today and the way we did them um, 50 years ago. Uh, so, uh, here we have this statement, and the question is, uh, in spite of this statement, is this innovation uh, that they make these achievements in semiconductor technology, uh, and if it is innovation, uh, what happened to the uncertainty that we uh, very commonly feature as being a pervasive feature of innovation efforts, and what happened uh, to the creativity uh, that we very commonly feature as a necessary aspect of innovation processes, uh, uh, considering that according to Gomery, uh, uh, this is uh, a repetitive uh, process. So, uh, you say that doing it over and over, what was he speaking of? Well, of course, he was speaking of uh, the repetitive steps in the progress along the miniaturization trajectory of semiconductor technology, uh, basically making, making the uh, transistors smaller and getting more and more uh, computing power 
onto a, onto a single chip. Um, and this uh, phenomenon or the existence of that path uh, was noted a long time ago by Gordon Moore when he was, I believe he was director of R&D at Intel at the time, and I think that date was uh, 1965, at which point it had already been going, uh, going on for some time. Uh, so when Gomery made his statement, he certainly wasn't denying that uh, uh, that uh, progress had been made in semiconductor technology. Indeed, when I uh, called him up to ask him the permission to quote him on this point, uh, he was a bit concerned that I was going to represent him as denying the existence of the progress. I said, no, no, that's not what I'm interested in here. We understand the progress is very, very large, and uh, it's that fact that makes your statement um, uh, so, so striking and worthy of uh, reflection. And since that was 1983, uh, we've had uh, another 20 years of Moore's Law, in which time it has progressed uh, more or less on schedule. Uh, so that would imply uh, that would imply another factor of about a thousand in the density uh, of uh, transistors on a chip, which is a rather striking achievement in, uh, in 20 years. And uh, Intel, as you see, this is uh, from their website, a day or two uh, still features uh, Moore's Law uh, as key to its strategy um, and, uh, and professes to be, you know, optimistically pursuing its uh, continuation. Uh, if you follow this story at all, you know that uh, in fact, there have been many, many hurdles uh, overcome along the way. You know that there are many times when it appeared that the progress might stall. Uh, you know that uh, it's not just a question of uh, figuring out how to make uh, one device with a very small line, smaller line width than the, than the last generation. Uh, there are uh, uh, complex issues of coordination, in particular with equipment suppliers uh, involved. Uh, and there has been a repeated uh, influence of the hand of government uh, to uh, try to uh, promote the advance of this uh, of this technology. So this is not uh, this is not a strictly technological phenomenon. Uh, certainly not strictly aligned with uh, phenomenon. Strategic, managerial, public policy, multifaceted. Uh, multifaceted phenomenon. And that uh, suggests that the capacity uh, to carry this act off and carry it off repeatedly um, is an impressive thing. Uh, it is in the category, though, makes it look easy, like a dramatic athletic feat or something is, is something they, they, an individual so skilled in this kind of performance that uh, that uh, they make the, the very difficult thing look easy. Okay, so, uh, so a lot of this discussion uh, today is going to be about uh, figuring out how to reconcile Gomery's impression uh, with, the, uh, with the innovation process, look for other examples of that, uh, ask uh, what it uh, means uh, it means to us. So that is, in effect, our uh, lead example of dynamic capability is Intel's ability, in particular, to carry off that long-term pattern of change, um, understanding it to be the multifaceted uh, phenomenon that it uh, really is. Now, of course, this phenomenon has uh, other facets and implications. So. Uh, there's the world of the iPhone app. I don't know how many iPhone apps there are by now, but it's a very, very uh, large number. And of course, one of the uh, kind of get rich, uh, get rich quick aspirations of our time is to figure out yet another uh, iPhone app that might, uh, that might uh, actually uh, make some money. Uh, so, uh, so 
the progress in semiconductor uh, technology and uh, cheap computing is what enabled the iPhone uh, in the first place and the iPhone is what enables the activity that you see in the domain of <coughs> iPhone app. Uh, and I would argue that in that domain you have you know, wonderful creativity, uh, people thinking up bright ideas, trying to turn them into business uh, success with startups and entrepreneurial ventures and so forth. A uh, terrific uh, story about capitalism, capitalist development. Uh, this is creativity enabled by the progress in semiconductor technology. And then we have the story on the other side, the uh, story of Smith Corona, a, uh, originally a producer of typewriters and uh, diversified into electromechanical computers, uh, um, uh, tabulators. And, uh, and then uh, came the uh, electronic revolution and uh, this company had a great deal of difficulty in uh, coping with that uh, revolution. And finally, and actually, uh, wound up in Chapter 11 and ultimately in a, in a liquidation <coughs> bankruptcy. And there's been, uh, there's a terrific article on the uh, Smith Corona uh, example, appeared in the uh, Strategic Management Journal, and uh, says, well, they, uh, they tried to transition their business. Um, they succeeded in the first couple of steps, but uh, never had more than 11.8% of sales outside of typewriters and accessories and uh, supply. So, uh, Daniels looks at this phenomenon under the heading of dynamic capability. Here's change. Uh, here's the company not coping with this change very well. How do we uh, understand that example and what does it tell us uh, about dynamic capability? Well, uh, his, his case shows that it wasn't for want of trying that they failed. Uh, if just motive recognizing that there was a problem and uh, trying to cope with it were enough, uh, they would have survived, uh, but uh, they didn't. And there is a suggestion that perhaps they didn't quite recognize the problem clearly enough or early enough, as these examples uh, surely uh, other examples illustrate. But um, uh, it, it can be argued that actually the most valuable asset, given what they've done in the past, was their brand and the related distribution, etc., uh, things. And so to speak, the weight of the typewriter was just too much. Uh, the public was not uh, evidently prepared to see this company uh, translate, uh, transition into things that were uh, much different than its older business. So that is, that is the creative destruction side of, of the Schumpeterian competition. Here's this massive progress in uh, semiconductors, cheap computing, a whole bunch of uh, electronic devices based on that technological foundation. And it's a great uh, constructive performance by the central actors, but around the edges uh, there are a bunch of actors getting killed by it um, because they cannot cope with the uh, problems of change that have been uh, created by this, uh, by this uh, dramatic progress. Uh, so that's a, that is kind of the story in, in brief. Here you've got uh, uh, the Moore's Law story. I would argue that consistent with what Gomery said, the elements of creativity, element of uncertainty, uh, other features normally associated with innovation are not prominent in this achievement, but the consequences uh, for society and for other actors are dramatic nevertheless and uh, involve a lot, of, uh, a lot of creativity, a requirement for creativity of which Smith Corona did not have enough, and, um, and also a dramatic amount uh, of uncertainty. So I'm going to further explore basically that set of ideas. So, now, uh, 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 Bart has uh, mentioned, of course I'm well aware, that uh, 
probably here. Uh, evolutionary economics ideas are quite are quite uh, familiar, and it may be that uh, for a few minutes here, I'm going to say things that is that are uh, indeed familiar to you as the way uh, evolutionary economists uh, often talk when they uh, talk about uh, technology and uh, production. And nevertheless, I think it's useful to recapitulate that to see the continuity between uh, that way of talking about production <laughs> and the uh, question of dynamic capability. So, when we have a, a uh, firm, say, that can produce a certain productive result, uh, a, uh, a common way of talking about that is to think of there being a recipe by which you could produce this result, and then to affirm that if you, only, if you have the ingredients and you have uh, the recipe, then you ought to be able to produce uh, the result. Um, this I have uh, uh, come to call uh, the recipe theory. And the recipe theory is a, a very common feature of uh, everyday discourse and, is a com and it is basically built into the economics textbooks at a very uh, basic level. Actually, the recipes that you find in the economics textbooks are very sparse uh, recipes. Uh, one can have recipes that are much more fully articulated than that. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, they live, these stories in the textbook, live in the family of the recipe theory. There are a lot of ideas about intellectual property, uh, secrecy, etc., what it takes to, to uh, be able to uh, make a profit or to steal somebody's idea, which are also based on the recipe theory. But uh, evolutionary uh, economists typically uh, don't entirely endorse the recipe theory. In fact, they think it's very important to uh, complement those ideas with other ideas and emphasize the fact that just because you've got a pile of inputs here and a recipe here doesn't mean that you can actually implement the activity of turning this pile of inputs uh, into some desirable output by, by the emotions declared in the recipe. There are a lot of uh, gaps in that, in that uh, process. And um, so the alternative view emphasizes, emphasizes the importance of some component of experience, trial and error, refine the details, learn what the instructions really mean in practice, all, lots of things which are, which are uh, common not only in the setting of uh, production in firms, they're common in individual learning of skills, they're common in the kitchen, they're, you know, it is this pervasive uh, phenomenon uh, that, uh, that uh, this element of experience and practice uh, is often a crucial complement to whatever can be obtained uh, from the, uh, from the uh, recipe. So we're continuing, uh, continuing in that uh, tradition here. Um, and so when we're talking about individuals, as I just was, we can talk about uh, individual skills. We recognize the importance of practice in obtaining in individuals, attaining individual skills. And in organizations, we talk about their established routines as playing an analogous role as the nervous system, the, 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 uh, the, the things that convey uh, and store uh, the information that is actually required in the concrete execution of the production task that actually uh, 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 brings about the, the output. Uh, so, uh, we came to come to talk about organizational capabilities. Uh, actually, uh, the, the Nelson and Winter book was, had, had a, a title uh, originally of an evolutionary theory of economic capabilities and behavior. Uh, so the term capabilities was actually in the title. Uh, that title was, was rejected as too long, so we had to change it. Uh, so uh, that uh, last paragraph that is, is a definition of a uh, organizational capability, which is uh, from a paper I wrote in 2001, I think it was, and uh, uh, emphasizes the the reliance of the capability com uh, concept on the underlying understanding of uh, under organizational uh, routines. 
and uh, to amplify that or clarify that a little bit. So there are lots of routines around that, that aren't uh, that aren't uh, necessarily parts of capabilities in this in this uh, sense. There are routines which are uh, dysfunctional, just like there are individual habits that are dysfunctional. There are routines that are acquired acquired without realizing that they have been acquired. Uh, but uh, in the domain of capability, we think of these structures of ways of doing things, uh, interrelated routines that are the crucial uh, informational component of the uh, productive activity, uh, to the, in, 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 particularly in the gaps where recipes uh, do, not, uh, do not reach. Okay, so from that start, uh, then you say, well, there are what we uh, call ordinary capabilities or sometimes operational capabilities, uh, which are the ones that an organization uses in order to earn a living in the present. Inputs in, productive process, outputs out, money in, buy more inputs, continue. Okay, so there's a simple uh, and uh, survival-related story about uh, about how uh, these things these things work. Because if you can't get that money in order to buy the next dose of inputs, uh, then you're not viable. Uh, so uh, uh, businesses have these kinds of ordinary capabilities. And then some businesses have uh, dynamic capabilities, which are systematic activities that permit them to change the ordinary capabilities, so as to continue to make a living under changed circumstances or to exploit opportunities to make a better living. And just as uh, cap ordinary capabilities are built up of uh, routines, uh, you could say that uh, any kind of dynamic capability that produces uh, the result described here involves a component of innovative activity. Uh, but not all innovative activity falls under this new dynamic capability heading, uh, nor uh, is it true that dynamic capability involves only uh, innovative activity. So that is to emphasize this is a distinct concept. Uh, okay, so in this concept, the way you're hearing it from me, there is a central role for learning and practice. So you understand the intel performance with which we started as resting on the accumulation of a huge, uh, huge amount of experience, not just in producing semiconductors, but in producing better semiconductors according to a Pre, more or less pre-designated formula by, by performance time after time. That is, the, uh, that is the dynamic capability, and that, in this interpretation, is another kind of learned competence. Okay, now you don't have to use a, have a dynamic capability in order to change. There are lots of ways to change which don't involve dynamic capability, and which I have, uh, uh, used the term uh, ad hoc problem solving uh, as a portmanteau term for all those other ways of coping with problems of change that don't fall under this learned competence dynamic capability heading. And there's a, a particular illustration for that that I think uh, is uh, instructive, uh, which is to think, about, to think about project teams, which in organizations are very commonly uh, uh, deployed in order to meet some challenge that comes in from the environment or to look into some opportunity that may be uh, coming from the environment. And uh, there are two uh, possibilities which one can illustrate. And, uh, actually, we, some of the studies at Wharton actually illustrate this distinction I'm about to make. One way to use the project team uh, in order to accomplish change over time is to appoint a new team every time a problem of a particular kind arises uh, and more or less pretend it's the first time the problem ever came and set the uh, project team to work to figure out a solution to the current issue. 
the other way is to uh, appoint a project team and look at the list of members of that team and try to maintain some kind of di continuity uh, in the project team that is put on the task. And you can also, another uh, symptom is, another is the use of what the military calls after-action reports. That is to say, when we're done with this particular uh, task for the project team, do we have a follow-on phase whose intent is to capture the lessons so as to transmit them forward in time to the next time that we confront such a problem? Or do we not do that? Well, if you're emphasizing uh, continuity in the personnel of the project team, if you're doing the after-action reports and a couple other things you could name, then you're taking steps which are in the flavor of uh, creating dynamic capability. I'm trying to make use of the experience in a specific way so that it's available uh, the next time I need it uh, to carry out and to take an example where we did this. For example, a company, it was HP at the time, uh, doing a series of technological alliances. You can address the management of these alliances, one project team at a time, or you can do the second thing I described and try to uh, and try to accumulate experience. And when you are accumulating experience, you are going the, down the path of building dynamic uh, capability. So that is a, quite, a, quite a concrete uh, managerial face uh, of the problem and of the distinction between uh, dynamic capability and ad hoc uh, problem solving. Now there's another way Aside from these uh, project teams and so on, it's important to uh, recall this prominent uh, example uh, where if you're carrying over the same general set of knowledge and the same problem-solving heuristics uh, from one example uh, to the other, uh, then uh, you are uh, following what Giovanni Dossi would call a technological paradigm. And if you see what the consequences of that over time is, you see the technological trajectory, for example, the miniaturization trajectory in, uh, sem in semiconductors. Uh, so uh, that, that uh, carrying over of the, of the uh, key heuristics and another basic features of the problem-solving task is another way in which the past matters for today's problem-solving. And... Uh, and another face, in effect, of, uh, of dynamic capability. There's, there are lots of these examples where, uh, where companies are doing something like that. They are exploiting at the core a set of uh, scientific and technological knowledge which, uh, which they apply repeatedly in uh, the creation of novelty that will work in the uh, marketplace. Uh, well, all of this... Uh, talk in the management literature uh, started with a, a paper in uh, 2007, David T. Scary Pisano and Amy Schoen in the Strategic uh, Management Journal called uh, Dynamic Capabilities in Strategic Management. Uh, this has paper, I might say as an aside, it has a, a significant relationship to my uh, to my career as a management professor. Before that, I had been an economics professor. I joined the Wharton School uh, in 1994, uh, teaching for the first time uh, PhD level courses in uh, e economics and management. And uh, fortunately, I was I was uh, equipped with a copy of this paper, uh, which David had sent to me. In fact, he probably sent it to me and. 1990, and it was uh, submitted to the SMJ in 1991. So, so I arrive at my seminar with this great example of a frontier paper uh, in preprint in my hand. I sign it. We uh, discuss it and so on. Next year, same thing. It's still a uh, frontier paper. No sign of it in the journal. Next year, same thing. So it supported my reputation as a management professor for quite a while uh, before it uh, finally appeared uh, in print six years after it was submitted. 
uh, to the uh, to the uh, SMJ. So uh, there's the pointing to these high technology interests uh, industries as as the place where the phenomenon is uh, most clearly seen, as the Intel example has already suggested, and uh, 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 dynamic means the ability to keep up with the game, to uh, redeploy uh, assets and achieve uh, new competencies. And uh, this was this was offered uh, as this as this quotation from more recent visit by long, very excellent paper by David Tees on this, gives his perspective on these questions. Um, so this is, this is offered as an answer to the problem, uh, how can business firms achieve sustainable advantage, that is to say, keep making money in a consistent way, uh, in a, in a uh, dynamically changing environment. Uh, so there, there's the uh, statement uh, of the role of dynamic capability uh, in that environment. Sustainable advantage requires more than just the difficult to replicate knowledge assets. It requires dynamic capabilities. Okay. So that's a different story from the uh, conventional story in the in strategic management or industrial organization uh, literature because a typical story in uh, that older literature, as in the older I.O. literature in economics, uh, identifies uh, sustainable advantage with a position, a static position, which is somehow protected. So, original classic example, a government grant of monopoly, a barrier to entry, a patent, etc. You have a certain way of making money now, and you can continue it, because you're protected from imitation uh, by one uh, cause or other. That is the old story. So this story is not about static advantage. It's about not that we have a lower cost way of producing. It's about we have a way to continue to lower the cost of production or to create the new generation of uh, products uh, uh, in a sustainable way uh, so as to continue even in a dynamic environment. So this got a lot of attention in the strategic management literature because uh, it, it answers this old question uh, in a new way. Now you might say probably sustainable advantage is in the end a will-o'-the-wisp uh, and you can't do it, but uh, anyway this is a plausible idea about how to do it. Uh, so then the difficult questions start appearing, like, is there a way to get this for free? Uh, and if you can't get it for free, uh, how much does it cost, and are you sure that it pays off in the end? Okay, those are kind of stuffy economist type questions uh, that come up when we've got a great new liberating idea like this. So you think about that a while, and you realize, and you look at the examples, and you see, no, it can't be for free. Uh, it can be, well, let's not go into that, not enough time. But it can't be for free. So uh, if you're not using it, uh, it's basically an overhead cost. Uh, and it may be pretty expensive to stay prepared for uh, the future in that manner. So that means that uh, probably it's not a very realistic option for small firms because uh, they've got enough to cope with staying alive in the short term. Then notice you're going to invest in something that doesn't create a current revenue stream for the sake of hedging against future change or being prepared to uh, exploit future opportunity probably doesn't make much sense. So it is uh, not surprising then that the domain in which uh, this kind of, these kinds of ideas seem actually relevant uh, is... Uh, is the domain of the large organization. And this is basically spelling out what I just said. You know, let many a startup appears someplace with a product either in hand or almost in hand because they thought it up with a brilliant flash of insight, because it was suggested by the old job they had and a firm that's going to be the customer, 
because it was the kind of thing that was going on in the lab and the university that they came from, uh, common sources of inspiration for a round of product innovation often embodied in a new uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial startup. But, uh, and, and many a success has been realized on that basis. But that by itself doesn't tell you how we're going to stay uh, as a viable business as the world continues to change. And the burden of trying to do that in any systematic way is probably a burden that a small firm uh, is going to have uh, trouble carrying. Okay, <clears throat> so that is a that is a uh, a first pass at thinking about the economic consequences of of these ideas and what they might mean, for example, for the firm size distribution uh, and for turnover in the firm population, because it says that uh, circumstances which are favorable to the creation of that first round of new products and whatever, are not necessarily favorable to the creation of long-term viable enterprises. And that fact, that it says the, uh, uh, the uh, microbiology revolution in, in, uh, in pharma, you know, played out that story uh, quite, quite clearly. So the government-funded R&D, uh, the university labs, and so on, uh, primed a pump for a lot of companies to start up and try to do things, but did not uh, provide uh, uh, really the resources to, to for uh, a sustainable position in a changing in a changing world. Okay, so uh, I'm raising the cost question. I'm touching on this uh, next point about the uh, conceptual controversy. Uh, in the original statement, um, uh, people read that statement and they noticed a, a tautological aspect to it. Uh, and the aspect is, well, it's great to be able to keep on uh, being competitively uh, successful. Uh, how do you uh, how do you do that? The answer is you have dynamic capability. How do we know that you have dynamic capability uh, because you've been competitively successful over a long period of time? Uh, so that was viewed as not quite compelling uh, and uh, or useful, right? So the discussion gets started about <clears throat> on this question of tautology. So my stance, oh, my stance in this conversation is to em emphasize this learned competence uh, way of thinking about it, which is what I've been expounding to you, right? So learned competence doesn't come, doesn't come for free. Uh, it's, it's necessarily got hazards built into it that its relevance may die, even Intel's confidence in new semiconductor devices may die, almost certainly will die eventually, when the world gets past the range where that confidence is, is useful. So on these kinds of grounds, I think I know, I was suggested a couple of things, I think I know the kinds of things to point to uh, as visible activity in organizations uh, that suggests the existence of the quest for dynamic capability which could then be, you know, compared with the record and ask the question of whether uh, these kinds of things uh, actually do pay off. And uh, actually, a few dissertations done at the Wharton School uh, essentially did uh, simple uh, examples of that. It's not an easy thing to do, and the, but the evidence is largely supportive of the fact, yes, you do sensible things to learn, it tends to pay off, that kind of, that kind of uh, uh, conclusion. Okay, so uh, there remain uh, a lot of things on which, uh, oops, sorry, uh, on which you can hear, uh, you know, conflicting views uh, in this conversation. I'm emphasizing dynamic capability as an organizational re attribute resting on learning practice. But some of the discussion sounds like it's more of a top management team characteristic, maybe a characteristic of the CEO. Uh, David Teese being a fairly successful CEO uh, himself uh, always seems to me as perhaps the uh, uh, archetype that he has in mind of, 
of dynamic capability. Um, so uh, it's a question of, as I've suggested, should we talk about this as if it were mostly about technology, or is it bigger than that? I said it's bigger than that. Is it uh, built primarily through learning, or does it matter a lot who you've got in the firm? Uh, maybe at the top, in that top management team, maybe at the bottom, in the people who uh, actually carry out the relevant activities. And on that one, uh, I do not have a, uh, a position. I think the uh, a position emphasizing the human resources aspect of this problem might very well have a lot of value. Uh, and I don't know, you know, I don't know any research that's particularly sorts it out. Uh, so, and lastly, so I would argue that in spite of the fact that these, that these emphases seem different on these kinds of dimensions, that actually they're pretty much complementary, and there is a, there is a, there's an aspect of uh, can't we do, can't we have it all, can't we think of this uh, concept in, uh, in these diverse ways and catch uh, something important about it. But it is a conversation that is still uh, in progress. Okay. So, uh, very briefly, if you didn't notice already, uh, there, is, there is a link back to the uh, Schumpeterian origins of uh, evolutionary economics here. Uh, Well-known contrast between early Schumpeter and late Schumpeter, in which uh, in the early work you see, uh, you see more or less discrete innovations impinging on, a, on an equilibrium system. And then in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, uh, Schumpeter speaks briefly about the uh, routinization of innovation. And you could say uh, that dynamic capability is a new lingo for talking about the routinization of innovation uh, that, uh, that Schumpeter pointed to. Uh, I think it is, I think it is uh, more than that. And I also think, as I, as I went back, actually as I went back to prepare this lecture, uh, I was struck by how little Schumpeter does with that idea uh, when, he, when he introduces it. Uh, he says innovation itself is being, uh, is being reduced to routine, but then technological progress is increasingly becoming the business of teams of trained specialists who turn out what is required and make it work in predictable ways. Now that, as I say in that next bullet, that sounds to me not like the routinization of innovation, but like the routinization of invention, specifically product development, coming up, coming up with the new product uh, that works. And it does not, and the technological emphasis is, is really clear, and it does not uh, touch upon the uh, span of issues confronting the innovator that Schumpeter had emphasized in the theory of economic development, talking about how he's swimming upstream, uh, the entrepreneur is swimming upstream, trying to overcome diverse social resistances. Um, and in fact, the paragraph above that quote says more or less the same thing over again. It says, the entrepreneur carrying out an innovation has to confront this diverse range of things. So let's emphasize the distinction between innovation and, quote, mere invention. And recall Schumpeter thought invention was cheap. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> yeah, Schumpeter one thought that anyway. So, uh, uh, so this doesn't go very far to uh, actually spell out the routinization of innovation. Schumpeter didn't go very far. You could argue that some of this dynamic capability literature is trying to do more, something more like that. Look more at the larger process in which uh, change uh, is actually occurring. Look at these supplier relations with the uh, uh, equipment manufacturers, look at the government role, look at the resistance from other competitors, so on, the, to the kinds of things that, uh, that Schumpeter would have uh, emphasized. Okay, so I'm running short on time. I'll leave some time for questions. 
Okay, but very quickly, I don't want to overemphasize this technological aspect uh, with an example like Intel, although there are many other uh, technologically based examples. <laughs> Take there, for example, the pharma. But in a very different uh, class of examples, which I would assimilate to uh, this dynamic capability idea, uh, involves the large replicator organizations uh, of the world. And the replicator organization being an organization that uh, has a particular way of doing business locally and finds more and more localities into which to do that uh, particular kind of business. Um, so we've got, we've got lots and lots of different categories of replicator organizations, but some prominent ones. Fast food, think McDonald's, one of the classics of the type. Uh, mass retailing, think uh, Walmart, uh, Norge. Uh, hotels, think a whole bunch of them. Furniture, think Ikea. Uh, banking, uh, think HSBC and, 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 uh, and others. Uh, all of them are organizations uh, whose idea of how to make their way in the world is to do one of the things on Schumpeter's list of types of uh, innovations, new markets, right? Is to, carry, is to carry your product or your service into an indefinitely expanding set of markets. Uh, so, yeah, in case you may, you may resist, the uh, juxtaposition of McDonald's and Intel. Uh, I can understand that. I have this, my phrase is it's chips with that. They're both about chips. So. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but let me, let me fight with that uh, resistance a little bit. The thing about McDonald's is uh, you can make a hamburger in your kitchen. As the same thing about uh, Starbucks is, you can make coffee in your kitchen. Uh, the thing about Hilton or Marriott or whatever is, you've got a bed in your bedroom, right? So, so the, end, the end product in these things is mundane, right? It's the thing you, you say, that's not a big deal the way uh, an iPhone is a big deal in terms of something you can create in your kitchen. Uh, but uh, the point is, that's not what these replicator organizations are about. Hilton's not about this. McDonald's is not about hamburgers. What are they about? They're about outlets. The, the challenging task is not the production of the conventional uh, output of these things. It's the dynamic capability. It's the exploiting, it's the pursuit of new markets by bringing this thing to more and more places. So that is the task set that you're thinking about when you think about this is a challenging thing in which experience matters and so on. So I was uh, in, in Hong Kong a few years ago and there's a on the Kowloon Ferry, there's a poster on the wall that shows the location of the nearest Starbucks and there are uh, seven of them in walking distance. Okay, so that, <laughs> that is the, uh, uh, that is the uh, thing that these replicator organizations uh, can carry off. Okay. Well, the understanding of replication is, of course, a central evolutionary problem. Uh, and that's why, uh, after thinking about its relevance to evolutionary theorizing in general, I sort of took up replication as a, as a uh, topic uh, back... Uh, in the late 90s, I guess, when I was very fortunate to get uh, in a partnership with Gabriel Zelansky, with whom I uh, did quite a bit on, on replication. Uh, so this is a wonderful topic. I recommend it to you for your courses. Uh, it's wonderful because it's easy to see it in the world. Everybody can see it, right? You can walk out there. Uh, you can see it in the world. You can see it in the financial pages. You could ask what the relationship is. Uh, there are lots of things you can do. This is the uh, list of some interesting questions, uh, all of which I think have been, have been uh, uh, at least partially explored, but there is a lot of, uh, a lot of open territory uh, there still. Um, uh, so let me wind up with some of uh, the generalizations that I want to leave you with here. 
Uh, first of all, I argue, of course, that uh, dynamic capability actually actually exists as a pervasive phenomenon, major source of economic change. Uh, as said, it's it's uh, most characteristically seen in some of these uh, large organizations, which do uh, the same thing quotation marks over a very extended period of time. Now it can't be really the same thing. It comes back. That's the uh, that's the Ecclesiastes version, right? With uh, no new thing under the sun. <clears throat> Hence, a semiconductor chip today uh, is the same as a semiconductor uh, chip 50 years ago. Uh, no, that's too aggregative a view of what you mean by the thing. They're doing the same thing at the level of uh, semiconductor devices, but they're doing it uh, very, very distinctively uh, differently. And uh, that's where the dynamic capability aspect comes in. Uh, and there are numerous challenges and not just challenge, technical challenges involved in the ability to do this, whether we're talking about a uh, technologically founded capability or whether we're talking about the kind of uh, capacity that uh, uh, spreads uh, a particular kind of outlet uh, around the world. So there's a question of where does one come out? And I would argue, first of all, a lot of this change uh, is clearly a, uh, say, say the case for it is as strong as the case for economic development in general. Um, it has, it has, uh, there are qualifications to the case, but uh, that's true of economic development in general, not whether uh, it's an unamb unambiguously uh, good thing. But what's striking me is the fact that this, these highly practiced dynamic achievements are reshaping the world at a remarkable rate. Right? So we look at the semiconductors, the iPhones, the telecom, we look at the mass retailers, the supply chains, we look at the hotels, the fast food, the, you know, and you look around, look around your airport and your shopping mall and what you're going to see is the faces of a bunch of organizations which have mastered a certain amount of change uh, because they're very experienced at it, and they're pushing this change at us. You, know, you may like it, you may not like it, but it's coming at you. Uh, and, so, and so I think it is a very important uh, aspect of the way the world now changes. It presents a lot of policy questions which are hard to catch up with, um, and uh, so I uh, would like to invite your attention to what I think is a uh, extremely, extremely uh, interesting topic. Thanks very much for your attention.